Hello students. Welcome to a new segment called Five Pictures. Now, because of the whole um, not being in class thing, we can't cover everything that I'd like to cover in class. So I'm going to do a very quick lesson in five pictures of different um, things that we should cover. So in this case, we're going to do five pictures, the history of the Franks. So, picture one. Behind me, or somewhere here, there should be a picture of Clovis being um, baptized. Now, Clovis was uh, the first Frankish king to undergo baptism uh, around uh, 511. <laughs> Certainly don't have sheets down there with information on them. Uh, so he underwent baptism. He was... Uh, convinced by his wife, who was a Christian, that he should convert to the Christian God. Now, Clovis, uh, being a Frank, was worshipping uh, a variation of Woden. Now, he was convinced when, on the battlefield, fighting against the Germans, the Alemanni, he realized that his gods had abandoned him. And so, according to Gregory of Tours, his chronicler, he decided to turn to his wife's god, uh, the Christian God, and ask for help. Now, this should sound familiar. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Constantine did at the Battle of Milovan Bridge in 312. So, the uh, story could be apocryphal. Um, now, the thing that he did, he converted. Typically at this time, when a ruler of a peoples would convert, everybody else would convert too. On the ground, likely that didn't happen. Likely many people still continued following the old ways of Woden. But, um, for all intents and purposes, when Clovis converted, so did all the Franks. Picture two. This is the Battle of Tours. Now, the Battle of Tours is supposed to have taken place in 732. This image itself is from the 12th century, so much later. It depicts Charles Martel, or Charles the Hammer, defeating the uh, Muslim invaders of France. Uh, this is important because it is essentially where the, uh, the Arab conquest into Europe was uh, paused in the West. They never got beyond uh, tours and were actually pushed back to the Pyrenees. Uh, so this is important in establishing that kind of uh, combat march zone between uh, the Umayyad Caliphate and the, uh, the Frankish Empire. It establishes Charles Martel as an important figure. He later becomes uh, the, uh, essentially the founder of the Carolingian dynasty. His son Charlemagne uh, is a big deal. We'll talk about him in a moment. Uh, the other thing that's really of note here uh, is establishes this border zone between uh, Islam and Christianity in the West that provides a great many of uh, epic stories. In particular, the Song of Roland uh, uh, takes place there during Charlemagne's reign, but still this marcher zone of combat uh, exists. And uh, so that, that element uh, kind of plays in there, which is why you know, the Battle of Tours kind of shows up as an important uh, element. Thanks. Image three. Now this third image is of Charlemagne. He's a big deal. Uh, he essentially, he founds the Carolingian dynasty in uh, Francia, or the Frankish Empire. Uh, that's, you know, small potatoes compared to the other stuff he does. Uh, so, what does he do? Uh, he gets crowned emperor of, of the West, kind of, in 800 by Pope Leo III. Leo III, just on a side note, um, he was a pope, but he also was getting, Rome was unruly at this time. He needed to look to a secular patron that had power, and Charlemagne was that person. So uh, Leo was mugged shortly before uh, Charlemagne actually came to his rescue. Uh, anyways, so Charlemagne, why, why is he a big deal? Uh, he establishes, uh, well, centralizes the Frankish state. Uh, he brings back a state bureaucracy. Uh, he established it uh, under his rule. Feudalism in the West is kind of established in um, a, a, as a more formulaic uh, system, whereas uh, prior to Charlemagne, it, it existed, but not um, 
not essentially in, in, in full practice that is orchestrated and codified in law. Uh, what else does Charlemagne do? I'm, I'm not looking at my notes at all. He establishes a state bureaucracy, a uh, system of weights and measures for trade, which had fallen into disuse. Trade uh, after the uh, fall of the western half of the empire, uh, trade returned to this uh, style of uh, trading kind and goods. So Charlemagne's important from that. Uh, aside from that, he um, organizes, uh, works with the church, with P uh, Pope Leo III, to actually organize uh, dioceses. Uh, along the same uh, Roman uh, provincial uh, system that had existed during the Roman Empire. And that was developing uh, before Charlemagne, but he, again, makes it legal. He is the first real uh, convincing successor state to the Western Empire, which is why Charlemagne is, is really important. It's insulting that we're not going in greater depth uh, into Charlemagne in this course, but, you know, there's, there's only so much time we have available. So there he is in all his uh, glory. The next picture is of Aachen Cathedral. Now, Aachen Cathedral is very important. It's a new capital uh, region, thus showing Charlemagne's um, power to shift the capital. Uh, also, new capital for a new dynasty kind of makes sense. The other interesting thing is he decided to put his throne within the cathedral rather than in a palace, uh, showing the unity of church and state in the early medieval uh, period. Uh, the other important factor here that I didn't discuss when I was talking about Charlemagne is uh, the, the extent of his empire. So uh, I'll put a picture somewhere here, here, somewhere in the background of his empire. Uh, what, what happens with Charlemagne's empire is it expands quite dramatically under his rule. Uh, his son, Louis the Pious, um, he unfortunately divides it amongst, amongst his heirs. Uh, the Carolingians, um, under Salic law, they didn't have um, a formalized system of primogenitor. Uh, that's typically the uh, first eldest son uh, inherits land. Um, in this case, Louis the Pious divides uh, the Char uh, Carolingian Empire among his three sons, which leads to significant fragmentation. The mantle of the Roman Empire in the West, it actually passes uh, to the German uh, part of uh, Charlemagne's empire, Lotharingia and uh, the conquered Saxon lands. Um, and that actually kind of comes back around 1000, so 200 years after Charlemagne, in the form of the Ottonine, not Ottoman, Ottonine uh, dynasty under Otto I, II, and III, and they uh, call themselves the Holy Roman Empire. This conglomeration of states actually sur survives in, in, you know, in some sort of fashion all the way up till 1806 when Napoleon essentially abolishes it. So it's a, a very long lasting kind of state conglomeration. Last image that we have is a Saxon. Not the people, um, the type of kind of short sword. So the people, the Saxons, were actually named after the weapon that they well uh, wielded. Weld? Sure. Um, so the Saxons are named after a small uh, dagger, long dagger or short sword. Um, they come from a region in Germany. They, uh, under the leadership of Hengst and Horsa, they invade the British Isles when the uh, Romans were in retreat. That's during the uh, fourth century. But in, for our purposes, the Saxons are kind of important in that uh, Charlemagne went to conquer them and convert them. Uh, he decided to invade uh, the Saxon lands. This would be, you know, in modern day uh, Western Germany, uh, Saxony, go figure. And so he invades the Saxon lands to convert uh, the, the pagans. Uh, they would have also been followers of Woden. Um, they prayed to a tree called Indramusil. This tree bears some resemblance to Viking legend as the tree that holds uh, Mitgard, Nifgard, and Asgard together. Well, uh, Charlemagne burned it down, kind of angered a lot of Saxons. They fought a series of wars, 
Now, the reason why the Saxons are important and their defeat is important uh, is uh, this begins another phase in European history. Uh, when you remove the buffer state of the Saxons between Charlemagne and the Norsemen and the Daemon, well, then you have uh, this, this unintended consequence of the Viking expansions. The theory goes like this. Now, this is not the only cause for why the Vikings decided to expand uh, and move out from their lands, but it is one of the causes. We'll get into other causes for the Vikings when we cover them. But um, Charlemagne decimated the Saxons. The Danes were on the other side of the Saxons, um, and when they saw Charlemagne coming, they began to organize. Danish rule and Norseman rule was um, very decentralized. But you get this incredible growth of centralization under um, Eric Bluetooth, uh, same symbol for Bluetooth. Maybe I'll put it there, is also a Viking rune for his family name. Anyways, under him and I think his predecessor, uh, you get increasing centralization in uh, the Norse, uh, Norse lands. That's not a coincidence. They centralized because of an external threat. That external threat was Charlemagne. So the Saxons and his um, war against them unintentionally results in uh, at least help spur centralization within the Norse kingdoms, uh, which later leads, perhaps contributes to their expansion.